What else can I say at this point? Um, later on this morning, uh, after we introduce the judges and the finals will come up and they'll each have about five minutes to take us through uh, their essays and describe their interpretations and some of their challenges, some of their glories and so forth and so on. And then the judges and all of us will have an opportunity to take about a 35 minute break as the judges put their heads together and go through the final process of determining who our three uh, winners will be today. Uh, the top three winners, first place is a $7,000 scholarship, uh, second place is a $2,000 scholarship, and third place uh, goes to $1,000. So uh, it's an exciting day and uh, a thrilling opportunity to be able to, to watch these young men and women interpret their own renditions of photography. So we'll have that momentarily, but first I'd like to uh, take a moment to introduce our esteemed group of judges, and if you could stand uh, briefly when I call your names, uh, Alan Shaben, a staff photographer with the Los Angeles Times, also a, a graduate of our college. So Alan, thank you for joining us here today. Callie Kessler, uh, another one of our graduates and a freelance photographer in New York City, who also has been all over the place shooting photographs since her graduation. Robert Cohn is a staff photojournalist with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Robert, thank you for joining us. Steve Smith is a professor of visual communication. He joins us today from the University of Connecticut also called UConn, correct? So, and finally, Anna Reed, a photojournalist, another one of our graduates from the Omaha World Herald. So thank you again, uh, judges, for coming here, spending your time with us, uh, putting your heads together, analyzing and talking about discussing the work of the 17 students who have participated in the challenge this year. Um, at this time, I'd also like to introduce a colleague of mine, a good friend, and also a uh, esteemed photographer and photojournalist in, in his own right, uh, visiting photojournalist professor, Sean Hill, who has some of his own observations to make. So, Sean, please come on up. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Um, you guys, everybody did a really great job this weekend. Um, I know it was hard for some people, but you persevered. Um, what I need to talk about is this contest. So. Why is this a photojournalism contest and not a fine art contest? Um, for a photo contest, scenic photos, landscapes, and sunsets are nice, and they're fine, and we appreciate them, and they touch us. And, but at its heart, fine art photography is created for and by the photographer. It's strictly his vision. Um, so when a picture is up on the wall, if he's happy with it, then that's all that matters. That's the main goal. Plus, for fine art, they are more directors than, say, a photojournalist is and is supposed to be. So, however, the difference, the main difference is with fine art and photojournalism is this. Photojournalism pictures have people in them and people connect us. That's the main thing. That's why people are important for the pictures and why is that? Because when you see a picture of either a family or somebody up there, you realize that could be me. You empathize with them. You put yourself in their place. Um, photojournalism also differs from documentary, street photography, editorial, and celebrity in that it needs to be honest. It is what it is. You can. You can change your vantage point and all that, but you can't change what is happening in front of you, and that's the main thing. My final thought is this. This is the College of Journalism. The College of Journalism produces journalists, so this contest is meant to encourage the next generation of photojournalists, and that's what I hope it does. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And you don't need any examples of that that perhaps at this moment are more powerful than what we're seeing unfolding through the photojournalism that's taking place in Ukraine. And um, every part of this world is now associated with this horrific event. So uh, thank you to those photojournalists who are uh, putting their lives on the line to inform us, to compel us, uh, 
to give us reasons to be participants in civic responsibility. So thank you again. Um, so let's do this. I also want to introduce some important members of our audience today. Of course, this would not be possible without our donor, Phil Perry, who I think at this moment is actually involved in another uh, administrative search someplace else on campus today. Uh, he's actually, I think, part of this uh, live stream and tuning in as well. So we'll talk more about Phil, uh, Mr. Perry, later on this morning uh, when our dean comes up uh, to also talk more about him too. So uh, our scholarship committee, uh, Sean Hill, who you just uh, were introduced to, Jill Martin, Monique Farmer, Karez Hassan, Tiffany uh, Grote-Lucian, Nicole Blackstock, Caitlin Van Loon, and Andrea Gahagan. So thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. They've been working really hard on this, um, not just this weekend, but this is a planning process that basically has taken months and months. So uh, thank you for joining us this morning as well. Alan Eno was also here, and I'm looking around. Uh, Alan is probably uh, part of the live stream, his class, who are also here this morning, and they are live streaming. They've also created some of the video content that you uh, watched in our introduction this morning. We'll also have some videos that they have produced that introduce us more to the biographies behind our judges as well today. So thank you, Alan, and thank you, uh, students, for joining us and being part of this and helping to produce this this morning as well. Uh, Megan Schulte Covert for designing the Life After logo. Life After was the theme for our portfolios, the essays that our photojournalists were producing. And uh, so thank you again for that. And now I'd like to introduce the five finalists. I'm going to give you their names first and then I will ask each of them to come up. They'll have about five minutes to discuss their essays, uh, show you what those images look like, if we have time, maybe take a question or two, and then we will move on. And uh, our finalist star, and you can hold the applause until I, I say their five names, Naomi Del Camiller, a freshman from Omaha, Ariel Fry, a junior from Vermilion, South Dakota, Haley Haar, a junior from Lincoln, Nebraska, right here, Jordan Moore, a sophomore from Lincoln, and Lauren Pennington, a sophomore from Parker, Colorado. So congratulations to our five finalists. Each of them will receive one of these glass uh, keepsakes and finalist uh, memento to take with them and display proudly wherever they choose to display that. So uh, I want to begin, first of all, though, by introducing Naomi Delcamilla, a freshman from Omaha, advertising and journalism major in our college. She is our first finalist. And uh, Naomi, please come up. and. The floor is yours. Let's give her a round of applause. Hi, first of all, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to do this. Um, I joined this challenge so that I could get um, critical feedback that can really make me be a better photographer. At the end of the day, it doesn't really, to me, matter uh, where I place. It just, I'm just happy to be here um, and get some, some feedback that I can use down the road um, for whatever I pursue. Uh, as far as photography, I am undecided. I love photography. I love telling this these kinds of stories. I love narratives, um, but I am interested in the over, overarching meaning of journalism and what it does for society and how can I be a part of that and bring it towards um, 21st century and digital and keep people engaged because I think that is really missing right now. Um, so I want to start and let you know I did Jeffrey Katerba. He um, was a full-time cartoonist at the Omaha World Herald for 31 years and in September of 2020, he was laid off without notice. Uh, he was called. He didn't get a chance to thank readers or say goodbye or do a last cartoon. Um, he was abruptly cut off and had to take a turn and decide what was next for him. I chose him as um, a layoff piece because he, in the 18 months since his layoff, he has really established himself in a new light. And this is a case where it, it, it was a recent layoff, but he has transitioned to his own new life and is really, really good at what he does. He's, be able, he's been able to make a new platform for himself um, and keep doing what he loves. So I actually emailed him a week ago. <laughs> a week ago, I think. I follow his Patreon page. Um, growing up, Omaha World Herald was on my kitchen counter when I woke up and had breakfast, and I saw his political cartoons and only started understanding what they meant as I got older. Um, I... Sometimes I'm scared that people won't re re like respond you know, when you reach out, uh, but the worst that you can get is a no, and I thankfully got a yes. And that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned in journalism is that you can really just put yourself out there and you can see what happens. 
I want to start with this picture. Um, this is him in his studio. He works mostly digitally now, but he used to do pen and paper. Um, he's challenged himself to really dive deep into political cartoons and what does this mean for society, not only for him to process what's going through the world, but also help others and shine a light on what's going on. Um, I wanted to follow the subject as close as I could, um, but I think it was a challenge as a student in a contest without a publication behind me to kind of ask to get closer and closer and closer when I had only met him. Um, well, I, he was a stranger at 6 p.m. on Friday night and quickly became a friend by 8 p.m. <laughs> so I had two hours with him in his studio. Uh, he was getting ready for a show, uh, the first COVID cartoon show in the world. Um, and it's the first time, I think two years out, we're starting to process what this really meant and what really happened. And to watch him really get ready for this show, prepare, and then walk upstairs and get to share this with other people was really, really powerful. Um, and this is, we're, it's another way to process it. And I haven't seen cartoons like this in a concentric circles that just really laid the scene of what went, what went on. And you can see the transition in some of, his, some of his work from when he was doing pen and paper at Omaha World Herald to now working on his own and how is he gonna use that change to just absolutely embrace what was going on. Um, so he's transitioned to Patreon. Uh, which is how freelance artists can, it's a subscription service, and I got, just got to talk to him about how does he still make a living from doing what he loves. Um, after a layoff like that, it's not the same. He doesn't have um, some of the financial stability that he got at the World Herald. So it was really interesting to talk about how he transitioned to Patreon and what his subscription is like. He mentioned that after he got cut off from the Omaha World Herald, he had four to 5,000 people reach out looking for him because they missed his work and they wanted to know what he was doing and wanted to talk to him. So that really struck me. Um, I, I really wanted to find out, I mean all of this was, he was getting ready for a show and we were just having a conversation. He had a cup of coffee on the table. Um, I really felt like a journalist, almost more than a photographer. I was over his shoulder. Um, I was really engaged in what he was doing. I think a lot of photo essays are different this one is a narrative. This is, has a beginning, a middle, and end. This is a two hour time slot I spent with a person. I got to know him. I got to be over his shoulder, look at his work, and I got to follow his process. So one of my feedback, one of my pieces of feedback yesterday was that this does look like a process piece, um, but in my eyes, that was the story here. That was how he is communicating his, his thoughts um, and what he does with his life. And Right now, he's been making cartoons about Putin and what's going on in Ukraine, which is very timely. You know, he takes, he doesn't get his ideas from other cartoonists, he gets his ideas from reading the news in the morning. And taking all of that info in and just finding a way to communicate it. Um, so I actually had two pieces of Putin because I got to see how far along he got in a cartoon. He did a, like, a draft for me really quick. Um, it was just really fascinating to watch that full process and then eventually get to go upstairs um, and watch him greet guests. So this next one just shows more personality of him drinking coffee um, and looking at his past cartoons. He did a lot of reflecting with me when I was there, talking about um, what he used to do at the start of the pandemic when he thought, oh, I'll be drawing about this for a couple of weeks. His cartoons didn't even have masks on, you know, and then him going back to his drawing um, and his notebooks for years. He's been doing this, again, for over 31 years, and it was just really powerful to see um, how far he's come in his own. Uh, he had, he keeps um, photos of his first cartoons from the Omaha World Herald where his cartoons had half the detail they do now. And he just, he just looked at me and he was like, look at this, look at how far I have come. Um, and he actually brought it upstairs to the gallery and held it up against some and just showed me how far he's come. So I just really felt like he wanted to communicate who he was and I wanted to show that through these photos. So again, this is, um, a finished version of what he was starting. So these concentric circles you start, and I actually got to walk through, um, and they it's not just about COVID, it's about everything that has been going on the past two years. And that was incredible to have this visual of what was going on. Um, he loves his own work. If I take anything away from this photo essay, it's that he loves his own work. And I think that's really powerful. And I think I encapsulated that with this photo and also this photo of him walking through his own work and just smiling at what he's created. And I think pride in your own work is one of the biggest lessons I could have gotten from this. And then my final one um, is this sketch. He 
he just talked about how heartbreaking it was, um, but how big of an opportunity it, it has been. Um, if I could, I would have spent a month or two with this subject and gotten to trust him or have earn have him earn my trust um, and vice versa, but I didn't have that. I had 24 hours and really just a chunk of two hours to be in his studio and then go up to um, his gallery with him. So I'm thankful for that time. Um, I didn't want to push and ask for more because again, this was a stranger two hours ago and I just had to do my best as um, an aspiring journalist, an aspiring photographer um, to do what I could and tell a story and I think that these photos do that. Um, that narrative arc, that beginning, that middle, that end. We start in his office and we end with his signature. I just think it tells that chronological story of a night in his studio with Jeff Katerba. So I just want to thank you again. And I was wondering if anybody has any questions. Okay, my question is, how did you come up with this idea? Like, what made you think of, to reach out to him specifically? Thank you. I was actually struck by Connie White's layoff just a couple of weeks ago. We are family friends with Connie White, and that was my first contact. I have her number. I reached out to her. I was super respectful. I said, I know this is really fresh, um, but this is a story that I'm interested in. And she respectfully declined, which... I mean, I totally understood, and I thought local journalism is really powerful, and local journalism um, is taking a turn right now, and how can I show that people like Jeff, super talented people in our community, like this is, he is a Nebraska treasure, and he also got, he got laid off, and instead of that fresh layoff from Connie that I could have gotten, but that was a little bit personal, um, I went with somebody who had already developed a new platform. Um, but yeah, I really was struck by her. I mean, I, I cried when I find, found that out because there are just so many talented people right now who um, are getting laid off. So, yeah. Could you repeat that? Hey, let me hand the microphone to you so our live stream folks can hear. Did you ask him for more time? I know you had the two hour block, but did you say, hey, can I come, can I stick around longer or, or what? The I stuck around for what I felt was necessary. Um, I think I could have stayed around longer, but I know that this challenge is about time and it's about doing what's within your time frame. Um, I've never done a challenge uh, this with this time limit to the caliber with the judges that are sitting in front of me. Um, I did I did ask um, certain things about like, hey, can we go over here or um, can you show me what's in your closet? Like, can you br bring out some of these old sketchbooks? You know, so I did get to go into that. Um, but I didn't think it was right to, you know, follow him for a whole 24 hours, you know, especially without the backing of a publication. Um, I mean, this is a photo contest, so I just had to keep that in mind and be respectful because this is somebody who, um, this is his uh, livelihood and this is, he had a gallery, he had guests coming, he got, was interviewed by the press. Um, I just kind of got to be a fly on the wall and I was grateful for that. Um, wish I could have gotten more, obviously, but yes. You just said he was interviewed by the press? Yes. No. What? No. Well, he had, okay, so it was the concentric circles, and then he had a guy from the radio come with, uh, gave him a lapel mic, and he just got to talk about it. Um, that is an image I should have gotten. Um, I think I was just kind of watching, at that point I was watching the guests walk through it and see how powerful it was for them. Um, but that is something I could have kept my camera on. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Our uh, next finalist is Ariel Fry, a junior from Vermilion, South Dakota, a broadcast major in our college. And uh, please come on up, Ariel.
So hi, my name is Ariel Fry. Um, I'm a broadcasting major, and um, when I got this um, uh, theme of life after, my first thought was life after loss, and more importantly, life after recent loss. Um, when I think of life after loss, um, I thought of um, people in my community, and most importantly, people in my community in Vermilion. Vermilion is a smaller town. People know um, other people and people situations, and so that's when I learned about Leisha. Um, Leisha is a mother of two, and um, her husband just recently passed away within the last four months. Um, she has basically developed into this super mom character. Um, she has taken on the responsibilities of, you know, father, mother, everything. Um, she's basically had to do everything. She doesn't, she wakes up when her kids get up. She she goes to bed when her kids go to bed because she doesn't have a lot of energy to stay up past that time. Um, I didn't tell my subjects to do any, anything special. I didn't tell them, hey, can you go stand over here? Can you, can you do anything? I just wanted to step back and let them do their thing. I asked them some questions. Um, I wanted to get to know them, but I didn't want them to feel like they needed to do anything special for me. Um, some challenges that I faced were the sequencing of my photos. Um, as you can see, um, as I go through my presentation, some of these photos the beginning part is taken on Saturday, and when we go to this photo, it's taken Friday. Um, I went to Vermilion on Friday night, and then Saturday morning, we had a basketball tournament, and we had to deal with those challenges. Um, I wanted to go through her life and how she has to run through all of these activities, but when we go through this part, we're dealing with, with bedtime and dealing with those kind of things. I wanted to go through her day and how she has to deal with those sequence of events, morning, afternoon, nighttime. Um, what I didn't realize is that when I had to sequence these photos, I had to deal with, the, with an eight-year-old's bedtime. And so that was kind of the challenge is where do I put those photos? In chronological order or what an order that makes sense? Um, another um, challenge is that a lot of these photos in their house are in low light. They have an older house. They, you know, it wasn't gr great conditions to take pictures in. Um, but I did, I did my hardest, and you know, that is, that's all you can do. Um, I wanted to take this time to also thank my family and my friends for, you know, giving me the support to actually do this challenge. I wanted to thank Leisha and her family for allowing me to tell their story. Um, I wanted to thank the judges for being here and taking the time out of your schedules for, you know, doing this. I wanted to thank CoJMC faculty that specifically spent their time for doing this challenge and the rest of the College of Journalism. Um, but that is um, my work, so thank you.
Okay, Ariel, uh, questions. Uh, we have a question from one of our judges. Let me pass the mic off. It's, it's more of a comment. It is something I thought of last night when I was back at the hotel. I realized, well, shit, if these kids are going to bed, that means that was Friday night. So you did purposely put it in that order where it felt like a day in the life, but it really wasn't. So I really appreciated that you took, you took that um, sense to, to really make sure that it was kind of beginning and end that way. Um, and like I said yesterday, I think these home photos are, are the strongest part. It's the emotion. It's the family. Um, and the low light conditions, eh, that happens. I, I think you did okay. Uh, I don't, don't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> so it's not really a question. It's just a comment. But oh. Yeah, I think that there are some really nice moments in here. And the reality of being a photographer is that in most situations aren't ideal as far as light goes. Like most of the situations I find myself in are low light. Um, sometimes I use a flash. I don't know if that was available to you. Not that a flash would have been appropriate in this setting anyway. Like you kind of just have to bump the ISO deal with it. Um, I've been there. Um, I was going to say, you know, again, this probably could have benefited from a slightly tighter edit, you know, like some of the shopping ones are kind of repetitive. And I think um, the one where they're eating together, like lunch out or somewhere, they're like at the table. It's like, I, I kind of like that light, like it's really soft and, and kind of has rich coloration and everything. I just, I want, I think like you know, and I made this, so I've done similar things when I was earlier in my career, but maybe wait for interaction. Like, don't just take the picture, like, oh, then this is what they're doing. Like, have your camera there and, and, and have your composition, like, ready to go, but then watch them talk to each other and maybe laugh or, like, have a, a moment because they're all kind of just, like, in their own, like, maybe they're cutting their food, they're eating, but, like, you could really elevate that moment if there's interaction. Two quick contextual questions for you, Ariel. Uh, what's the drive from here to Vermilion, time-wise, miles? <laughs> and also, um, did you explain how her husband died? Um, so the drive from here to Vermilion is basically exactly three hours. Like, I can leave here, get there in three hours. So I was there at about 8 o'clock. Um, and no one really knows how he passed away. Um, he was a very active man. He went to Vegas with his brother, um, went on a biking trip, and they found him in his hotel room. Um, and there wasn't really anything found. Um, I, tr I tried to, you know, stay away from the subject because the subject isn't about how, you know, he, you know, him being gone. It's about her, you know, being resilient and continuing her life after this loss. And she hasn't really, she hasn't really, like, she's adapted, but she's continuing to learn how to adapt after that. And that's kind of the point of the story. So, you know, I really appreciate that, you know, you gave me the time to give you that story. Thanks again, Ariel. Appreciate that. Our next uh, finalist is Haley Haar, who is a, a junior from here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Come on up, Haley. So yes, as he said, hi, my name is Haley Haar. I'm a junior broadcasting student um, here in the College of Journalism, and I am so excited to be competing this weekend because I had a faculty member actually recommend uh, me to take a look at this challenge uh, during my freshman year. And of course, because of the onset of the pandemic, I wasn't able to compete two years ago. Um, and then last year, I wasn't able to compete because of part of the narrative that I'm gonna share with you guys today. So I will preface that I did work with my family, and I think that's something important to know when you're looking at photos where a photographer has stepped into somebody's life um, and is looking for emotion. On the first day of classes this semester, my family uh, lost my paternal grandmother at the, na at the age of 93. And in the time since, um, life has picked up. I mean, classes continue, you still have to go to work. And so I haven't really had the chance to be home and experience this with my family. 
And so this 24 hour period, um, which was, you know, 48 hours with all the editing and whatnot, um, gave me a chance to be home and experience this with my family and see what the process of grief looked like um, through the perspective of my father. Um, I've had the chance in the past to showcase what my relationship looked like with my grandmother, and so I wanted to take this opportunity to tell the story of somebody that my dad loved the way that he loved her. I'm going to be focusing on the concept of an echo, and an echo radiates from its source often a moment of impact, this moment of impact being this loss. And in this instance, the signs of this initial impact, this loss, is still dissipating, um, but very much um, relevant and can be seen physically, emotionally, and in this case, visually. From here on out, I'm going to go ahead and um, approach it from the third person so I can view this essay as you are. Um, I'll let the photos speak for themselves in terms of what's going on, but I'll provide my insight. So in this photo in particular, I think this is when I realized that this is going to be a challenge to work with my family. I've got somebody that's comfortable with me, um, that kind of knows my work process, has seen my work before, um, but since I'm familiar with their emotion, I really wanted to push myself to find the moments that I haven't experienced before, the displays of emotion that I haven't seen before. Um, and my grandma and my dad in particular are ones that have always been strong, the strong ones for us. So when I got this photo, it kind of set the stage for the rest of the narrative. Um, and I had the opportunity, when we look at empathy, I really got to exude that because I am feeling with. This is, yes, my story, but I am feeling with him. Um, in this photo, he is taking a look at an old menu from a restaurant location um, that my grandma had in Dodge City, Kansas. For reference, my grandma left home at the age of 14, pursued a job as a waitress, and held that position uh, for 65 years until 2007 when she closed her res uh, restaurant that they, she, uh, um, she then owned excuse me, with her husband. <clears throat> and with this one, um, you know, it's easy to get photos of people looking at stuff, and so I wanted to try and find an interesting way to frame it. You know, garages aren't that pretty to shoot in, but I can try and find a way to frame a space um, and give some more texture. I think one thing that's really important, um, you know, life after, the idea of loss comes very easily to depict. Um, that's kind of where my brain went first. Um, but I thought it was very important, since this person isn't physically here, that I needed to show who my father was having uh, this reaction, this relationship with. Um, so this is a portrait of my grandmother um, in the floor of a storage unit that um, Paul and his family has um, that is holding all of her furniture right now. And this arm um, of the upholstered chair right here is actually still stained <laughs> from meals that she had um, here in Lincoln in her final days. Um, this photo, there was some question and kind of why I included it. We had a portrait of the woman who passed. Um, why do we need I, just pictures of pictures? Um, but this one was actually my favorite in my collection because at the top here we have, um, right at the thumb, um, is my grandma, surrounded by a few of um, portraits of her siblings. Right in the middle, um, not in focus, is a photo of her at the restaurant, actually, in her middle age. And then at the bottom of the frame, we have the oxygen tubes that kind of depict the later life. So three different stages of life in one photo. So we transitioned into the basement of the house and are taking a look through the collection of the outfits that he has collected. Um, anybody who knew my grandma knew that she had this immaculate sense of style. Um, and so this collection is a mix of personal favorites, staple pieces, um, and then eventually, towards the end of the, her life, um, the J.C. Penney sweatsuits that she wore. <laughs> and so I wanted to challenge myself again, let's not you know, use the door frame of a closet as our framing piece. Um, let's try and find a different way to depict this. Um, and as a kid, I will say I was definitely guilty of going through my grandma's closet all the time and looking at her clothes and marveling at it. So I guess you can say I kind of delved back into that and got back into um, amongst the clothes and captured this photo. 
So same idea here, but from a different perspective, kind of uh, peeking through the door at this moment here. This blouse is one that she wore um, during some family portraits, one that actually rested on her nightstand, um, and we still got it at the house today. Um, this is a piece that I overlooked as a kid. Um, it's not the most flashy, it's not the most colorful, um, but the fact that, you know, when I was able to say, okay, let's pick out some favorite pieces, like show me what you remember through these pieces of clothing, he went straight to this. Um, so I loved being able to capture this moment. So my dad has worked as the saxophone professor here at the university for the past 17 years, and in his time here, he has never composed a song. Um, but since experiencing things with uh, my grandma, he just had this overwhelming urge to do so. So this was um, him taking a seat at the piano that he had in his childhood home, now rests in our living room, um, playing through and notating the piece. And I don't think I have ever heard that piano played so loudly. This is an over the shoulder shot I knew I wanted to get. Um, I think it worked out really well with the framing in terms of the shoulder and the forearm. Um, the title should be noted that this is a quote that she um, used a lot. Just too late, too soon, we get smart. Now this photo, I received some very positive comments about it last night, which was to my surprise because in my traditional style, I shoot very tight. I like capturing the face um, because in my eyes, the emotion comes through the face. Um, and so I pushed myself to try and get something that was more atmospherical. Um, and so what we're seeing is a living room that has been decorated entirely with her furniture and decor. Um, but I encouraged, you know, before I came home for the weekend, I was like, please leave everything as is. Don't clean up for me just because I have a camera. <laughs> like, um, so we've got all of our belongings still here. We got saxophone cases on um, the couch. We got cat toys behind chairs. Um, but I think it's just a perfect mix of what's going on with us right now. And there was questions about me including uh, pictures of this young woman right here. Um, but Stephanie Nolda is one of my dad's students that came into our lives right about the time that we moved my grandma here um, into Lincoln and very qu quickly became close with our family. And my grandma had a tendency to really care for the people that she worked with. And I feel like this non-blood related family is really transferred um, to my family. And so Stephanie is definitely one of our, one of our family members. And she has, it, it has been so wonderful to see a lot of my grandma's clothing pieces passed to her because I am not of the same stature as my grandma, so I can't wear everything. Um, so to see it um, used, seeing a hand mirror used, I mean, anything to continue um, its legacy. And so here we go in one of those outfits. Um, getting ready for her job at Von Mar Luxury uh, Department Store real Retailer. And so all of these pieces that my grandma worked so hard to obtain because she didn't have anything growing up are now being used to um, look good at work and excel in doing such. So I, I wanna take a moment and say thank you to the judges um, for your time and consideration with everything, the uh, COJMC staff, the students here today um, doing the live stream, and thanks to my subjects. You know, even though it's really easy to lean on you guys for a subject, I think we got something very special. So thank you so much. Thank you, Haley. Any questions for Haley this morning? Hang on one second. We'll be right back. It's not really a question, but, you know, I love the piano shot. Um, I feel like... It's so good. Like, I don't know if you know Gregory Crutzen, but he's a photographer who I really love, and he does, like, these really cool, like, home scenes, um, like, where he, like, builds a set, and it kind of has, like, that sort of vibe um, with the, with the, your, is it your, your mom at the piano? Uh, or, but no, saxophone, who is playing the saxophone? Oh, uh, oh okay, okay. <laughs> well, it's cool, <laughs> regardless. Um, I feel like, uh, yeah, it's a really nice photo. Um, 
it'd be even like uh, for me like i would love to go in there and like recreate that shot too and like f have um an off-camera flash illuminating your dad playing so he's like less of a silhouette like um you know that's just my tech thing because i love that photo and like the window light's so nice and it's on her on the piano um i love that and i think it's good that you got wide because um a lot of um beginning people beginning in their photo careers like get comfortable in a certain uh focal length you know like there's a lot of repetition like medium shots um so it's good to have a little bit of everything again i think this um piece could have benefited from a tighter edit but that's something you kind of learn as you go um but yeah i, I think that that photo really struck me um it's definitely my favorite Um, I, I agree. Actually, I, I, what really caught me in that photograph was the lighting on the face of the pianist. It was just singular. It was really nice. So thank you again. Appreciate it very much. Uh -huh. Our next finalist is Jordan Moore, a uh, sophomore and a journalism major from here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Come on up, Jordan. Hi everyone, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share this story with you. I'm a journalism major here at Code JMC, and I did my essay on a novel idea bookstore here in downtown Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, they are a small business that's been open for over 30 years. So my interpretation of this year's theme is life after COVID, and also just life after uh, 30 years of being in business. So my first photo here, it's kind of dark um, being projected, but on the screen here, it's uh, the outside of the store um, at night. This was taken on Friday, so they were doing their first Friday celebration and, um, and also celebrating their Read and Color program, which helps to diversify the little free libraries here in town. This next photo here was also taken outside of the store. Uh, the bookstore is famous for having two cats. So this is their cat, Eddie. And um, I got a shot of a customer just petting them. They are definitely um, a famous mascot for the bookstore. And they bring a lot of comfort to the customers while they're shopping. This next photo here uh, is someone opening the door for customers to come in, um, I wanted to uh, have this photo sort of represent this welcoming environment. The bookstore definitely prides themselves for being a sort of safe space for people to come and shop. This next photo um, is really the only posed photo that I wanted to take. Um, I asked them if they had anything sentimental or any photos of them um, together. And so they brought this photo album to look through and um, I wanted to capture, it is posed, but I wanted to capture that special moment between them where they were not really focusing on the camera but focusing on each other. And I think that's the big idea that I wanted to display in my essay was connection and people coming together um, even after this time of challenge and during the pandemic. Again, this same idea of capturing uh, this moment where my subject doesn't know that the camera is on them. I decided to take this photo through a bookshelf. Um, she was at the register and she was listening to a customer telling them about their day. Um, and I think this really captures her personality and um, her connection to her customers. This next photo here is a customer named Ken, and he is a longtime customer. Um, a lot of the regulars come in every day, and they connect with the owner and um, with all the customers. It's almost like a family. This next photo is of Delena. She is a bookseller at the bookstore, and I wanted to capture her working uh, behind the scenes at the hold shelf where they keep all the books on hold. She was answering the phone and I thought that this frame was really nice and um, it sort of leads to my next photo, which was taken downstairs. Um, these are two siblings, Gabby and Elias, and um, it was really nice to connect with them. 
uh, and to see the wide range of ages that come into the bookstore. And uh, they were sort of tucked away in a little alcove uh, reading from the same book. This next photo here, again, I wanted to capture that moment where they aren't looking at the camera, but they're sort of just um, having a good time with each other and um, laughing and um, having that connection. This next photo here is of a stuffed animal that was left by a customer, and the bookstore is trying to reconnect, the, um, trying to find who left this stuffed animal. And I thought that this was a good way to represent how much they love their customers and how much they care for them. And so now this stuffed animal, until it's reunited, it, co it comforts um, other kids that come in, and um, it's also just very sweet. This next photo here, again, is that connection. Um, this is a local artist in town named Arden, and she is hugging Catherine at the end of a long day of um, selling her art and selling books. The bookstore is usually open until 6, but on Friday, since it was first Friday, they are open until 7.30. And so I got to capture this special moment. And I also really wanted to capture the gratitude that, um, the, that the bookstore has after um, COVID to be able to have these moments to connect with people so closely. And I think that was something that a lot of us can say we took for granted during the pandemic, um, just being able to connect with people so closely. And this last photo here, um, it was my last photo that I took and um, there were customers outside wanting to come in, but we had they had just closed um, and the doormat was sort of pushed up against the door and the message reads, thank you novel idealists, which is what they call their customers uh, for supporting our local business. And I think that when I was sequ sequencing my photos, I wanted to first begin with the outside, lead you inside and then lead you back out of uh, the door um, and sort of tell that story. So that's my essay. And if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Comments, questions. So uh, I'll say this about your photographs and about all the photographs this morning. It's, it's wonderful to watch a photograph and then dwell in it for a while, and you begin to pick out other things that you just didn't notice at first glance, which is the beauty of photojournalism. Uh, but anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you again. Yeah, and we have one more finalist in our, uh, uh, to present this morning. And uh, please, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, Lauren Pennington, a sophomore a journalism major from Parker, Colorado. That's a suburb of Denver, is it not? Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to sh for letting. Let me start over. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to share this story with you. I focused my photo essay on the Lincoln Ukrainian community and their response to the Ukraine Russian pandemic conflict. Okay, <laughs> we are off to a good start. At its heart, my photo essay is about people helping people. Being so far away from the country they left and having new established lives in America, a lot of the Ukrainian community is looking back at their homeland and the family and friends that still live there with shock and horror. They are listening on phone calls to bombings, attacks, they hear destruction, and they hear death. These are their stories. So on Saturday, um, the House of Prayer Church hosted a prayer vigil and rally um, in honor of Ukraine. This is a just kind of establishing shot that shows the people gathered there as well as the different communities in attendance because not only were um, generational Lincoln Knights there as well as Ukrainians who moved here as long ago as 25 years or as early as six weeks ago. Um, there were also Latvians and a couple other countries who I didn't have the opportunity to speak with. But. Um, there were children as young as two. Um, this is Solmia Veloska. Um, she's 15. She moved here um, in 2017 
to be with family, but she left a large majority of her family back in Ukraine. She arrived after the protests had already begun, but her arrival, it was, it commanded my attention. I wasn't even looking in the direction they were coming from, but they walked with such purpose that I just wanted to capture that and show it to you guys. Um, it's not the most action-y of photographs, but she knew what she was there for because she's not able to be there for her family and she's not able to really send resources. So um, like I said in her quote, protesting is the way I can show my support to them. So she's showing up and she's doing the one thing that she can. And I want to show that. Uh, this is Olga Stepanyuk, Oleg Stepanyuk. Um, he's the youth minister at the House of Prayer Church in Lincoln. Um, I thought it was really important to show him and the organizers behind this. Um, and I think it puts an emphasis on what they're asking for, just those resources and prayer. And he wasn't looking at me because I was in the back of the crowd, but I felt like this shot kind of established a connection with him that I wanted to show and like put the reader kind of there like they were in the crowd. Um, there we're asking for medical resources, like money for food, but if you couldn't give anything, they just asked for your prayers and that you kept them in your thoughts. And I just really wanted that request shown here. Uh, this is Jenna Saikinkova. Um, she moved here 10 years ago to be with her, um, her daughter who was already here and they have established pretty deep roots in the community. They have her daughter who she moved here to be with um, has had other children and they, are very involved in their schools and they just love Lincoln and they were very passionate when they were talking about that, but they also haven't slept in like a week because they are up to talk to their family members in other countries and they are battling time zones and they are just trying to do two lives at once in two very different locations. Um, people were praying and singing um, just fully immersing themselves in what this protest was. Um, this is Hanya Sorota um, during the national anthem that they were singing. Um, yeah, this is just another case of having so much family back there that um, it wasn't super um, quotable just with how broken up it was, but she told me how she feels helpless and that she can't do anything because she's just watching it on pictures or on the internet or listening on those phone calls. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, this pronunciation. Ludmida um, Shmushiv is the first person I talked to when I got there because I arrived early before it had begun and she was across the street pacing in front of the Capitol. As soon as I talked to her, she started crying. Less than a week ago, her family's town was destroyed while she was on the phone. She does not know if they are alive. It was very hard for her to be there. And this moment of just tension and pain I wanted to get. And she just doesn't know what to do because in that town, the stores don't have anything. So if they send money, they can't buy it or they can't buy anything. And like you can send medical resources, but they run out and you don't have a way to get more. And there's just no communication. So she's here to show her support for the other families, but she doesn't know what's going on with her own. Later during that same event, um, I caught her during a moment where she was just very immersed in what she was singing during one of the traditional songs of Ukraine. Um, and I wanted to have this where she was surrounded with the Ukrainian flag, but also um, the flag of America there as well. Um, she's very grateful for the community here and that the response they've had to this conflict, um, just with the support that the churches have offered and events like these, um, but at the same time, she doesn't know how to keep going if her family is dead. Um, and I was very grateful that she would let me speak with her at all. Um, I tried to 
show it on a little more of a larger um, scale than the one event. Um, I went to a Ukrainian church service vigil the night before, um, but unfortunately due to a variety of reasons, those photos couldn't be used. Um, and then I was actually invited to another one later in the day, but it was at six and our photos were due at five. So I wasn't able to include that here. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to share this with you. I'm open to any questions. Comments or questions? We've got one over here. Thanks for sharing the photos. Um, we were struck yesterday during the judging about how your, your photojournalism is strong at this event, but your written journalism is exceptionally strong too. I'm kind of curious, uh, I, I've covered dozens of these kinds of events through the years, but you got to so many people and got so many nice quotes before they all disbanded and disappeared. I'm kind of curious how you did that, and I'm also curious about the the service you went to beforehand that if you can expand upon that why why those weren't able to be used just a little bit more thanks so i guess i'll start with my process i arrived um about 45 minutes before it was supposed to begin um just to kind of scope it out and talk to um oleg about the order of things that were going to be happening so i knew kind of what to expect where to position myself and just what to be on the lookout for. Then I looked just kind of for moments. So when she was pacing, I took the photo before talking to her, um, obviously asked her permission afterwards to use it. But when people know you're looking, it's not the same. Like I have photos on my camera where they noticed me and like that moment just kind of got um, ruined because they laughed or they just like um, made a different reaction. So I would take those photos and then just go talk to them. Like pretty similar questions like, I know why we're here, but like, why are you here? Tell me your story. Um, and they were willing to talk forever. <laughs> um, and some of them uh, needed to speak with translators because they weren't fluent in English. So that was interesting as well. Um, the night before for that church service, it was um, at the house of prayer and completely <laughs> in the Ukrainian language. Um, they translated parts of it, but there were still parts where I was like, not totally sure what was going on. So that gave me the opportunity to focus on the crowd and the people praying there. Um, I did have some issues with settings and indoor lighting just because it was so very dark in the church that the photos where you could kind of tell what was going on were very, very grainy with the ISO that I had to use and um, just without having other resources to brighten it. And the photos that I did get that I felt would be usable, um, some of those people either weren't willing to talk to me, which is totally understandable, um, um, they didn't speak English and I couldn't find a translator in time, or they just left before I was able to get to them. So those were kind of the issues I faced with that. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah. Ariel Fry and Naomi Delka Miller. So thank you again. Now it's time for the judges to take about a 35 minute break and I will excuse the judges and they will put their heads together and they will have one more final conversation and then we will come back and announce the three uh, winners of the Perry Photo Competition. Also, um, two other things. Uh, if you want to step into the uh, uh, forum area just outside this auditorium, there are some uh, hors d'oeuvres uh, to enjoy, some snacks, some coffee, and some other beverages. And uh, I believe that Alan Eno and his students have also uh, put together some videos that will be running up here on the big screen that have some more biographical information about our judges today. So we'll see you back here in about 35 minutes. We'll introduce uh, our Dean, Sherry Vale, who will do the, uh, the final honors. And uh, thanks again for coming today.
uh, the Post Dispatch for, I guess, 23 years in May. And uh, I'm Robert Cohen. I'm one of six staff photographers here at the newspaper. And I've been at uh, the Post Dispatch for, I guess, 23 years in May. And uh, have been at this for 35 years or so as, you know, as a working professional in the business. And one of my first jobs was in Hollywood, Florida at a paper that no longer exists. But uh, I worked with one of the greatest photo editors I've ever met and by the name of Mark Edelson, who, who passed about nine years ago now. But the way he described photography and the way he described photos was that, you know, that, that words made you think, but photos made you feel. And, and that's the criteria I'm looking for when, when I help judge the Perry Photo Challenge. Uh, give me some emotion, give me something to feel, uh, make me happy, make me, make me sad, make me wince or giggle or so, something like that. Those are the kind of images that uh, I'm gonna be looking for as, as I judge the competition. So I've been doing this now for, like I said, about 35 years at uh, large newspapers, at small newspapers, and um, I've built a relatively large body of work and, and work that I, I look at every so often and kind of see, you know, what's, what's next. Uh, but there are a group of photographs that, uh, that will always be dear to me and that I will hold close somewhat because they're they're important to me, but they're also work that um, that I'm I'm known for, for better or for worse. I'm, you know, Google my name and Google St. Louis, and and you will immediately see photographs from Ferguson, Missouri, from 2014 um, that were taken after the police shooting of Michael Brown. Among that bunch of photos, of thousands of photos, uh, probably one of the most important photos that, um, that I've been known for is, is a photograph of Edward Crawford. Uh, Edward was a um, kind of a first time protester and I just happened to be there at the right time when early, early one morning at a police standoff, uh, Edward picked up a flaming gas, tear gas canister and threw it back toward police. Um, he was arrested and he was charged, but that photograph itself just took off and was extremely well known. Uh, within 24 hours um, on the streets of in Ferguson, I was at the Michael Brown Memorial and for the first time I saw uh, a man wearing a t-shirt that had the photo of Ed Crawford on it. And um, you know, within hours people were selling different versions of these t-shirts for whatever reason, people had a, a need, it spoke to them. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it represented the resistance in the protest and people had a need to replicate it. I had all kinds of art, images of artwork sent to me. Um, some people got it tattooed on their arm or on their leg or across their chest. It was, it was pretty remarkable to see. Um, it was also, on the sides of buildings in Massachusetts, also in like five stories tall in New Orleans. And so it's, it's a photo that I'm proud to have taken. Um, unfortunately, it's a, a photo that was only taken uh, because of the death of a teenager. But um, it is a photo that, I, that I've been known for. I would encourage, if, if you're interested in photography as a career, obviously there's many, many different ways to take it. If you feel that journalism is the right thing for you, then I would encourage uh, just working really hard and, and you know, getting up early when, when you know you're going to photograph something under really nice light. Uh, Go to, go to whatever you're going to photograph. Go early in the morning. Stay late after the event is over. Um, keep looking for things. You know, they, they talk about working the edges of photography and, and working scenes that, and, and bringing back pictures that aren't necessarily the obvious or the easy. Uh, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of planning, takes a whole lot of luck sometimes. 
but um, I would encourage every everyone out there, um, you know, per pursue whatever works for you. Pursue whatever dreams you have. Journalism is an extremely difficult industry right now. Um, there are not that many jobs. It's uh, you know certainly the newspaper journalists. There aren't a whole lot of us left. Um, yet, yet the news still needs to be told. The pictures still need to be made. And uh, good luck to everybody along the way. Thanks. You know, I always had that creative inclination and I'm very extroverted and I wanted to channel my talents into, you know, meeting people and, and creating. And so photography was kind of the perfect avenue for that, in my opinion. Why was I asked to judge this competition? Um, I'm guessing it's because I know a thing or two about photography and I love to be able to teach people and offer advice. And as an alumna, you know, um, it's an honor to be here and to contribute. And I'm happy to, you know, give pointers to students who are interested in photography because it's a really hard career to make it in. And so we need to use our community resources. And yeah, um, you know, for me, um, it's it's all about the artistic vision. It doesn't necessarily have to be about the technical execution, but it's, it's the vision. Um, I want to be able to identify with the photographer's vision and style and kind of think, oh, I see what they were trying to do. Like, I see how they were trying to tell that story with their composition and with the lighting and how they use the colors and negative space. So whatever just like draws me to an image, um, that's going to be what helps these students stand out to me. I'm just looking forward to meeting the next wave of photographers from Lincoln. You know, I want to see what we're working with here um, at UNL now that I've been gone for so many years, 2018. I mean, I didn't major in math, but it's been a while. So I'm just excited to connect with the new students and hopefully extend any advice and help that I can. You know, a good photograph is made up of a lot of different things. You know, there's a technical aspect, um, the composition, the lighting, um, the vibrance, all of that. Um, but it's also the moment, I think, you know, it's, it, does it convey a feeling? Does it evoke some sort of response in the viewer? Um, is it just interesting to look at, you know? How, do I glance at it and get the gist or do I want to study it and kind of spend time reflecting on, oh, how did they do that, you know? So I think there's a lot of different aspects that make a photo intriguing. For me, it's all about color and light in my photos. You know, I strive to make them interesting. I want them to maybe make someone laugh or have someone connect with the person in the photo. Um, I don't want it to be boring. I don't want it to be forgettable. I want it to intrigue, um, inspire curiosity, promote understanding, all of those things. Um, but my style is definitely is colorful because that's my personality. And I think that it's really important that your individuality shines through your work. For me, the most re rewarding thing about photography is just being able to meet new people and be in situations that otherwise I would never find myself in. Um, my friends that work nine to five jobs, you know, they have very similar day to days. They're kind of in a routine, which is cool for some people. But for me, I really feed off of um, variety and, and difference in my day and
getting to be in situations that I wouldn't otherwise be in, like the White House or on set of a TV show. Just it, it's the access. That's the most rewarding part is getting to um, meet new people and see new places. Um, one of my favorite photos I call high hoops, but this photo um, was one of my first photos that I took. Um, I, I was, I took it in 2015. So I was like 18, I want to say. And it was the first photo that I took that I was like, wow, that's a really good photo. Like I actually might be able to do this as a career. Like it was my, it was the photo that gave me the confidence to pursue photography professionally. And, you know, for me, it's, it's very unique because, um, the woman's arms are outstretched and she's like leaning her head back. And so her head is not seen in the photo, but the hula hoop is in a circle shape right where her head would be. So it's kind of like, it's kind of one of those funny images, you know, like it, it's intriguing. It's kind of humorous. Um, the color is great. There's negative space. The composition is strong. Um, I love a good centered photo. Um, so that's one of my favorites. Um, yeah, and I'm very proud of it. My advice would be to not let journalism put you in a box, okay? Because photojournalism has a set of rules and ethics that you have to abide by. However, if you're interested in, in photography in general, experiment, you know, do double exposures, do set up situations, um, play with lighting, like do a little bit of everything. I think like when I was in college, I was so focused on the photojournalism track that I wish I had spent a little bit more time experimenting and doing things that aren't necessarily journalistic, but still creative. Um, so just, you know, rules are meant to be broken. photojournalism for about the last 25 years since I was about your age. I worked um, at my student newspaper in my undergraduate program um, in my 30s, went back and got a graduate degree in visual communication and um, it's been um, the journey of a lifetime. <laughs> I've loved it. I got into photography. It's kind of funny looking back and thinking about how I got into photography and photojournalism. One is I would say I, I grew up loving storytelling and I really didn't find photography until I was in college to be honest with you. Um, I was an engineering major and I'm um, working my way through an engineering program, had done an internship and I um, took a photojournalism class and I laugh because <laughs> that was a big change for me because all of a sudden I saw this opportunity to to be creative and to to tell stories with pictures and um, maybe to have a license for adventure so I kind of didn't look back at that point I switched majors and um, jumped over to communication and journalism and um, Boy, I don't have any regrets whatsoever. How did I end up here, where I'm at right now? So I, I ended up coming to the University of Connecticut um, because I was really interested in teaching, but also being able to stay current and work photographically. So I, I do quite a bit of assignment work. I think in the first five years I was here, I did over 100 assignments for all, t all level of um, media organizations. So video for CNN, um, you know, still images for you name it, <laughs> kind of r runs the gamut. And I really love that opportunity to keep very current and to work hard in the field. Um, and that's that's been quite a pleasure, to be honest with you. And the opportunity to work with students and to share my dreams and to help them pursue their dreams, that's been amazing for me as well. So I'm super grateful for the opportunity that I've had here to, to teach in, in higher ed and to inspire the next generation of storytellers. I think that's quite a privilege, to be honest with you. On what criteria will I be judging the photos? So when I judge and look at photographs, you know, photography and visual storytelling is 
is complex and sophisticated. And there are many things that can um, push a photograph into a spot um, that makes it a powerful and strong photograph. So I'm looking typically for uh, multiple things that um, that help move a photograph. So I might, I kind of joke in class and call it, I'm looking for the trifecta. I'm looking for at least three things that a photograph functions in. And that might be for documentary work, we might be looking for an incredible moment. We might be looking for great lighting <laughs> and um, amazing composition. And that's a tall order if you think about it. It's a difficult order. But um, I think that's, you know, this field is infinitely complex and um, it's challenging and that's a fun thing. That's what makes it rewarding to continue and to pursue this field for, for an entire career. I've loved that. Photographs that were difficult to create. So um, I photographed, I worked in the Rocky Mountain West for a number of years and I photographed wildfires. And wildfires can be very challenging. Um, they are um, you know, an ongoing natural disaster that can last days and they can be extremely devastating, wipe out entire neighborhoods, um, you know, big swaths of land and, and be, you know, emotionally very difficult to cover. I think, you know, these types of stories over my career, I've really had to think about that, um, you know, these challenges that were faced in these situations. And I find that to be probably one of the most challenging things to do. It's a, maybe a small percentage of what we do. I mean, so much of what I do is, um, is upbeat and, and a lot of fun. Um, and these fires or these natural disasters, they're, they're more difficult to cover because there's a lot of emotion involved. People have lost a great deal, and it, that's painful to see. It is important, though, that, we, that we're there and we're telling those stories, and we record that for history. Um, I look back on some of the images and of the, my peers have taken and that I've taken, and you hope those images represent, you know, a country now kind of knowing and understanding um, wildfire and its dangers, right? I think I, you know, touching back on what makes a good photograph, um, I think there are just, there are multiple things that can. And it, it's not just one thing that makes a great image. You know, some people might say that, um, oh, we, we used to joke and say moments always win, right? And so you think of rock, paper, scissors, and moments always end up being the most valuable thing in documentary photojournalism. But sometimes it's about great light. Sometimes it's about great composition. You know, there are, there are many things that can make a great image, and moments are an important one, and we certainly look for those things. So capturing those maybe fleeting moments that really represent kind of iconic aspects of our day or of a person. And I, I, I like to think about it that way. Think about what's the iconic aspects of a particular person, the things that they do. What are the most important things? And can I capture that? Can I make an image of that? And can I do it in a, you know, in a beautifully composed way?
Hello everybody, I'm Kala Kessler and I'm one of the judges for the Perry Photo Contest. And I'm a freelance photographer based in New York and I graduated from UNL in May 2018. I mostly do editorial work, um, specializing in portraiture and features and fashion, um, but I definitely got my start in journalism from UNL. And I got into photography because my dad is an architectural photographer based here in Omaha and you know, I always had that creative inclination and I'm very extroverted and I wanted to channel my talents into, you know, meeting people and, and creating. And so photography was kind of the perfect avenue for that, in my opinion. Why was I asked to judge this competition? Um, I'm guessing it's because I know a thing or two about photography and I love to be able to teach people and offer advice and as an alumna, you know, um, it's an honor to be here and to contribute and I'm happy to, you know, give pointers to students who are interested in photography because it's a really hard career to make it in and so we need to use our community resources and yeah. Um, you know, for me, um, it's, it's all about the artistic vision. It doesn't necessarily have to be about the technical execution, but it's, it's the vision. Um, I want to be able to identify with the photographer's vision and style and kind of think, oh, I see what they were trying to do. Like, I see how they were trying to tell that story with their composition and with the lighting and how they use the colors and negative space. So whatever just like draws me to an image, um, that's gonna be what helps these students stand out to me. I'm just looking forward to meeting the next wave of photographers from Lincoln, you know? I wanna see what we're working with here um, at UNL now that I've been gone for so many years, 2018. I mean, I didn't major in math, but it's been a while. So I'm just excited to connect with the new students and hopefully extend any advice and help that I can. You know, a good photograph is made up of a lot of different things. You know, there's a technical aspect, um, the composition, the lighting, um, the vibrance, all of that. Um, but it's also the moment, I think, you know, it's, it, does it convey a feeling? Does it evoke some sort of response in the viewer? Um, is it just interesting to look at, you know? How, do I glance at it and get the gist or do I wanna study it and kind of spend time reflecting on, oh, how did they do that, you know? So I think there's a lot of different aspects that make a photo intriguing. For me, it's all about color and light in my photos, you know? I strive to make them interesting. I want them to maybe make someone laugh or have someone connect with the person in the photo. Um, I don't want it to be boring. I don't want 
it to be forgettable. I want it to intrigue, um, inspire curiosity, promote understanding, all of those things. Um, but my style is definitely, it's colorful because that's my personality. And I think that it's really important that your individuality shines through your work. For me, the most re rewarding thing about photography is just being able to meet new people and be in situations that otherwise I would never find myself in. Um, my friends that work nine to five jobs, you know, they have very similar day to days. They're kind of in a routine, which is cool for some people. But for me, I really feed off of um, variety and, and difference in my day and getting to be in situations that I wouldn't otherwise be in, like the White House or on set of a TV show. Just it, it's the access. That's the most rewarding part is getting to um, meet new people and see new places. Um, one of my favorite photos I call high hoops, but this photo um, was one of my first photos that I took. Um, I, I was, I took it in 2015. So I was like 18, I want to say. And it was the first photo that I took that I was like, wow, that's a really good photo. Like I actually might be able to do this as a career. Like it was my, it was the photo that gave me the confidence to pursue photography professionally. And you know, for me, it's, it's very unique because um, the woman's arms are outstretched and she's like leaning her head back. And so her head is not seen in the photo, but the hula hoop is in a circle shape right where her head would be. So it's kind of like, it's kind of one of those funny images, you know, like it, it's intriguing. It's kind of humorous. Um, the color is great. There's negative space. The composition is strong. Um, I love a good centered photo. Um, so that's one of my favorites. Um, yeah, love that. and I'm very proud of it. My advice would be to not let journalism put you in a box, okay? Because photojournalism has a set of rules and ethics that you have to abide by. However, if you're interested in, in photography in general, experiment, you know, do double exposures, do set up situations, um, play with lighting, like do a little bit of everything. I think like when I was in college, I was so focused on the photojournalism track that I wish I had spent a little bit more time experimenting and doing things that aren't necessarily journalistic, but still creative. Um, so just, you know, rules are meant to be broken. Have we reached a decision? I think we have. Welcome back to the Perry Photo Challenge. I'm Professor Barney McCoy here in the College of Journalism and Mass Communications at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And you've been introduced to our five finalists for the Perry Photo Challenge. And momentarily, we will tell you who our three scholarship winners are. Uh, to do the honors, though, I'd like to introduce uh, my boss and good friend and colleague, Dean Sherry Vale. So Sherry, come on up and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Barney. And thank you all for coming out this morning, now going into afternoon. Uh, I also wanna thank our incredible judges for the work you put into this week, and we're actually gonna ask you to come back up after we're all done to talk about uh, some of the decisions that you made. So please, a great hand for our judges. We also have a whole lot of people who are doing work around the room, as you can see, uh, hiding behind corners from students to our faculty and staff. So I also want to give a shout out to them because they've been planning this for months now to get everything ready. So thank you to all of our faculty and staff. And of course, none of this would be possible without our benefactor, Mr. Phil Perry. I've had the honor of getting to know Phil over the last couple years, and we have breakfast about once a month over at Good Evans, and we talk about everything. We talk about family, we talk about art, we talk about travel and politics sometimes, and we talk about life and the beauty of life. And so much of what he does and what he talks about looks at people and those relationships that you build that you build with people, and that's really important to him and how he has lived his life. And he's been incredibly successful, both in his personal and his professional life. And part of what has made him so successful is because of 
incredible qualities he has. Hard work, ingenuity, the willingness to just get it done because it's got to get done. And I think all of our finalists <laughs> have demonstrated that they have those same qualities. You came in, you had a tight deadline, and if you look at our finalists, we had one person who drove three hours each way for a story and another one that walked two blocks. And you all made it into the finals. So managing your time, being able to find the story, find those connections, find those relationships in your images has been really incredible. So congratulations to all of our finalists. And Phil did send me a message. He is on the live stream, and he just wanted to say congratulations to the finalists and to thank the judges and faculty and staff for this incredible opportunity that we're providing for our students. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to announce first our finalists. So you can think of this as our honorable mention. Uh, first up uh, as a finalist is Naomi Deckmiller. Did I say that right? Delka, Mil Delka Miller, come on up, Naomi. All right, and another finalist, Jordan Moore. Jordan. Okay, and in third place, receiving a $1,000 scholarship for her photo essay, Life After Invasion, Lauren Pennington. this first, but then you also get the big check, so. <laughs> All right, and in second place with a $2,000 scholarship for her photo essay, Life After Loss, Ariel Frey. And that means first place with a $7,000 scholarship goes to Echoes of a Matriarch for Haley Haar. And Haley, would you like to say anything? I can pull uh, checks if you'd like to. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just like to say thank you. I mean, there are a lot of people, even, you know, especially outside of the people I've already thanked, which again, thank you, um, that have helped get me um, to this place. I would especially like to thank Amy Struthers. Um, she was the interim dean at the time that I was switching into the college. And um, I wanted to know more about the major, and I bugged her. I said, I know this isn't typically the thing that a dean does, but will you sit down and have coffee with me and tell me about the program? And she goes, oh my gosh, yes, please. And we sat at um, the foundry and we had coffee and we talked and I told her what I was interested in. And out of that conversation, one of like, the things that stuck out to me, I remember her saying, oh my gosh, we do this photojournalism challenge, you have to do it. And then a few months later, it got canceled. Um, and so I am just very excited that, and happy that I got to participate, um, and I would have been happy with just that. So thank you to everybody. <laughs> thank you, Haley. All right, well, could we have our judges, would you rather stay there? Would you come up and just have a, a conversation, maybe provide some tips back to students who are considering doing this again next year, some advice for them and some of the, the reasons why you chose the essays that you did. Hi guys, um, the decision wasn't easy, which is good news for you. Um, I think there were some projects that maybe didn't get um, top three, but still had really strong images. Um, but we wanted to celebrate like the effort because um, like the bookstore story was really good. Like, um, and so uh, the cartoons, like 
um, both of you had some really unique moments. Like they were great photojournalism stories as an editor. They would be happy to have those photos be turned in, you know, and, and published. Um, what we wanted to celebrate is a little bit of like the research that, uh, and the effort that went behind, like, for instance, your story, like I think like driving three hours round trip is um, no easy task. I, as a photojournalist myself, I've had a lot of moments where I've done like really long hauls for a story and it's not easy to cover like a difficult subject, um, you know, and especially one where you're trying to gain like a family's trust and we thought that was worthy. So sometimes um, I think our, our reasoning is to prioritize like the, the story over um, like some of the technicalities of like the photos and stuff. And so that's why, you know, we wanted to celebrate your story. Um. I mean, she said a lot of it really. Um, but really, we, we just really wanted to emphasize some of the risk taking that, that people chose and the kinds of stories they wanted to pursue. We wanted to emphasize the, the emotion and empathy that was shown in these stories. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, just, just having that really photojournalist heart of, of being there, being a fly on the wall, but also feeling everything that they're feeling. Um, that's what we wanted to, to reward and, and, and uplift today. So thank you for letting us into all these people's lives. It was great. Good points, and I, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Perry and the University of Nebraska Lincoln uh, School of Journalism and everybody that put this on, and Sean, and um, all of you students and, and faculty, and um, all, your, all the subject matter, that uh, everybody that was willing to do this story. Um, please share those stories, get those, get those out there, because um, it, it's not just for a competition, this is their lives, and they would appreciate these stories to be told. And, um, and, and thank them that, that they told their stories for us. Um, but also, um, I just want to say, uh, you know, continue to, to push your visual boundaries. I hope some of the things that we've said um, can help, help you for the next year's challenge. Um, one of the things that, that kind of um, struck me was that um, maybe there are some great ideas, but they just weren't able to pull them off in 24 hours. So think about that next year. Um, what's, you know, find something you're passionate about. And that's one of the things that the top five uh, winners um, were very empath empathetic, um, very passionate. Um, and we, that really came through. And the, the top, um, the, the winner was the, the strongest connection with us, um, made the most emotional connection. Um, so continue to do that, um, you know, tell these stories. And um, I think that's about it. Again, thanks so much for having us. Um, it was amazing, amazing organization and, and just, just the way everything flowed and you fed us well and that was great. Um, one thing for, for next year, uh, pay really close attention to whatever the theme is. And, and that's we, I mean, the judging we did yesterday, the judging we did today. Um, it, it came down to who really uh, illustrate the theme the best and, and stay true to the theme. So um, so keep that in mind and uh, tremendous photos. I mean, really, really great stuff, great stuff I'd love to have for our newspaper and, and uh, you know, it's the in-depth work you do with families and people on the street and um, just telling, telling people about the members of your community. So whether you're local or driving a few hours away, it doesn't matter. It's just community stories are, are what people want to read and what they should be reading. So thanks again. A lot has been said. This has been a really fun group to work with, to be honest with you. And um, what a joy to, um, to be able to come here and, and help you guys um, develop and grow. And I hope that these, these stories and projects that you were able to work on really helped you kind of reach some new heights and to dig deep, um, you know, Picking the top five and picking the top three was tough, and it really made us think about subject matter and really trying to focus on that. But there was some really nice work that was being done in the whole group that we looked at also um, yesterday as well. And I, again, I really hope that this has been beneficial for you. When you think about some of the things that we talked about yesterday was digging deep, looking for that depth and layers, thinking about narrative, 
you know, thinking about weeding out redundancy. Um, those are all super critical things when we think about multiple images and telling stories with multiple images. And I think, you know, it's been fun to see this come together. And, you know, some of the work that was done was really nice. Super proud of you guys. Nice work. <laughs> And I think like a lot of you are younger, so you'll have another opportunity to do this in the future. And just remember, edit tighter and be wary of deadlines. You know, like it, it was really a bummer that we had to disqualify some people. It didn't feel good. Like I want to give everybody a chance, but I feel like the way that the college outlined the um, program, they put so much emphasis on take the time to upload, practice uploading, like you guys have a whole class before. And so... Unfortunately, the real world is going to hold you to rules, and even though we wanted to see everybody's work, it's like if we make an exception to the rules, then why have rules in the first place? And it kind of sets a dangerous precedent. But um, if you did get DQ'd, feel free to send us an email with your project if you want feedback. All right. Thank you, judges. Thank you to all of our finalists and all of our students who competed. I mean, incredible work that you had to do to get through all of this, and just really proud to have you in the college. Barney, I'll let you send us off. Thank you, Dean Vale, and thank you again for coming today. And uh, it's, it's not too often that we have these opportunities to, to share the creative work of a very talented group of uh, photojournalists and with great expectations for what will come in the future. So uh, that does it for this uh, 2022 version of the Perry Photo Challenge. One more big thanks again to our judges as well, and also to Phil Perry, who made all of this possible and will make it possible again next year. So we invite your participation and spread the word and spread the images. Take care.